Well, good morning. I hope you guys are ready for the third message in my series. Um, we're going through Ecclesi or yeah, Ecclesiastes. Rob, we're going through Ecclesiastes. I'm going to First Samuel, and um, I, I have some references from Ecclesiastes uh, this morning that I thought were uh, related to this message. But if you missed the previous messages. I want you guys, uh, you know, to go back because these, these messages complement each other. So they kind of build off each other. And they're always listed on Facebook and YouTube. We even have them in, uh, in podcast form. And um, I, I, I know that we've been going through this with the intention of we're learning personal application. We're, getting, we're, getting, we're going through the stories and kind of getting how it relates to us. Um, we're, we're learning how to read scripture, how to approach scripture. These are the things I'm trying to share through this. But at the same time, I'm really trying to magnify uh, the gospel through this. And that's the whole point, the gospel through this entire uh, session. We're going through Samuel, watching the stories kind of develop. Um, I won't spend too much time recapping, um, but I do have one slide to kind of bring back some of the previous messages, uh, notes that I had offered on, on approaching scripture. And so far, I've mentioned that uh, the Bible is coherent. Um, that it is uh, a book that makes sense. It's meant to be understood. You can read it, and it has a, a flow that it's going. Uh, the Bible has a purpose. It has a plan. It's written with a purpose in mind, and it's written to reveal something to you. And then the third one is prayer. You know, we need to pray that we would get wisdom. We need to pray that God would teach us things, but also praying theology into the soul, taking Scripture and praying it into our soul is just as important. And um, as a student of the Bible... You guys, everybody in here should be a student of the Bible. You would have heard at some point in time that Scripture interprets Scripture and that we need to have God explain to us what he's trying to say. Um, now, you'll see this play out in today's message. We're going to actually visit different, different areas of Scripture to kind of bring about, the, to get that understanding that we need that is necessary to make sense of what God is telling us. And, and you may already know this, right? It's simple. But in the process of searching, God is also uh, teaching us things that are very profound throughout this entire time. So I want to add a fourth one, and that is uh, I wish to add personal connection. Scripture is written to speak to us in a personal way. It doesn't mean that I have a personal interpretation, but it is written for me. It is written for you. It is a personal connection. There should be an intimate connection between the words of this book and your heart. Um, to truly appreciate God's word requires us to be intentional when we approach it and, and desire to receive the words. God, what are you saying to me? It's a personal book. What are you saying to me? And for us to listen carefully. Um, we should allow the scriptures to change us from the inside out. If you guys heard this verse, I don't have it up there, but it's a very common verse. All scripture, this is um, 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I mean, this is what scripture is. It's personal. It's meant to actually change us and do a work in our heart. But you know, I have found I have found in my life where I'm just kind of going through the motions. And you probably find yourself there where you read. I do my devotions, and sometimes my devotions are passive. They go in one ear and out the other because I'm thinking about what I have to do for the day. I read my verse, do what God has to say, and then I move on. And what I forfeit in those moments is a special connection with God. I forfeit that because I'm, I'm already moving on to the next thing. And, you know, we, we can look at Psalms, and, and Psalms, we hear the words, hiding your word in my heart, tucking it away in there, and, and let it wake me up. These are the things that we should be doing. Uh, you know, one of the ways that the connection is necessary, which is going to be the subject of today's uh, scripture reading, is that it magnifies the value of the sacrifice. We sung that song, Oh, the Rugged Cross. I mean, this song is beautiful, Right? And, and, and it gets us emotionally connected. Now, the scripture does that even greater when you go through and you start reading this. So let's begin. I'm going to start with this. It's back. Did I lose you? Yeah. A few months back. Did I go out again? Yeah. I'll leave it. A few months back, I was teaching in the kids' wing. And I decided to change what I wanted to do. So, um, 
it was funny because I went in there and we had a lesson. I'm supposed to do a lesson, right? I'm the teacher. I'm supposed to go in there and, and actually offer them something. And I, I went in and I asked them a question. I want to change the approach. I said, kids, I want you to teach me the gospel. I want to know. And I want to know, first of all, I wanted to kind of gauge where the understanding was, but I also wanted to hear their, their responses. So I'm going to read to you some of their responses, exactly how they, how they said it. Now, they were just, they were not sentences. They were little statements. We're talking about little kids here, okay? I asked them, what is the gospel? What does it mean to you? And I heard, Jesus does miracles, okay? And I heard, die on the cross, Jesus saving us from sin. The Bible. I didn't hear the. I heard the. The Bible. God. Okay, that's an answer. You could always say God. If you're a Christian, Jesus. That's an answer. I mean, it goes, it goes a long way, right? The gospel is powerful. I heard that. It means good news. Sin is bad. Sin separates us from God. Satan separates us from God. Sin takes over the world with Satan. God loves life. Satan loves death. Satan is bad. Sin is death. This is their response. Now, how cool is that? That the kids in the kids' way are saying things like, you died on the cross. That is the gospel. That sin is death. Did you know the kids understand that sin is death? They knew this. And that Jesus is saving us from sin. I saw their minds working, right? And I asked a question, and, and they were, I found it interesting because they were feeding off each other's energy. Once one kid would say something, another one would come up with a new response, and they were building on this thing. And what was really interesting was I did not expect is that they mentioned Satan in this picture. Did not expect that. They were feeding off each other's words, and, and somebody decided to say, well, Satan is bad, and, and, and Satan uses sin. And it was just like really interesting the way their mind was working. Um, but I was also really impressed with the fact that they recognized the problem of sin. They recognized the problem of sin. Our children, our children, although they may not be able to articulate this, and I can come over here and give you the great example, they understood the basics of the gospel, the basics. And... and but that tells me that they're hearing the message. They're understanding, they're getting it. The words are hidden in their hearts, and they can actually, if you give them time, they can bring it back. Now, most of this credit, I want to say this, most of this credit goes towards the parents. The church can only go so far. They're only coming here once a week. And when they're here, they're only here for one hour. And why are you laughing at yourselves? You guys got to take some credit. The parents. Good job. The responsibility ultimately rests on parents to regularly train and teach the children the gospel. And it seems from my perspective that parents are doing a great job, doing a great job. Keep training, keep teaching, and support the kids' ministry because this is where our children receive the deeper connection to the gospel. As they learn the truths, their hearts are refined and their understanding expands as they grow. Now, I'm saying this. This may be a passive-aggressive approach to search for children's ministry volunteers. <laughs> and it is. No, but I really want to emphasize that. Um, I want to emphasize that with the importance of parenting and teaching children. The importance of really sharing on life on life and using moments in life to really share what Jesus has done for you personally and sharing that with them. And you're doing a good job. And, and the reason why I bring this up, this parenting perspective, is because in today's passage, we're going to see bad parenting. We're going to see poor teaching that leads to selfish behavior. So we're going to be shifting our attention. I want you guys to go to 1 Samuel. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to be there in a second. And... We're going to be shifting our attention away from Hannah. The last two messages, I kind of in, included Hannah. And, and we looked a little bit at Eli. We had an introduction to Eli in the first message because Hannah ran into Eli in the temple. And she was trying to pray. And as she prayed, uh, Eli was judging her for being drunk. And that was kind of like the first mention of Eli. And um, it was funny because 
Hannah was, was given, given a real hard time by, by this man. And this is where the section begins, and we're going to start in verse 12. It's actually going to start with Eli's sons. And here's the first phrase. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. They were worthless. What a terrible introduction. Imagine that. See, in our culture, we're used to fighting for people, to encourage people not to believe that they're worthless, that they have some type of value, that there's something within them that is good. This is what we're being taught in the world today. And we want to believe that everyone has some value, and yet we're met with scripture that unapologetically states that these men were worthless. They were worthless. Ouch. And this is what it means. You just break down that word, worthless. It's Eli's sons had no value in anything. They had nothing good within them. They couldn't produce any good. They had no good qualities. It's a terrible measurement. Now imagine your name going into scripture for all eternity, for all the world to see, and the thing that you're going to be famous for is for being worthless. Gosh, that's awful. That is awful. And uh, for them to be called worthless, there has to be a flip side. There has to be a flip side, which means what is worthiness, which I hope you're going to get to this. You're going to get this in, the, in this message by the end. There's a, there's a contrast between worthlessness and worthiness. So here's the second description. It says that they did not know the Lord. This poses a problem because this statement is a direct contradiction to their job, okay? 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 7, says, Now there was a man, I should have put it up there so you guys don't have to turn there, but if you have your Bibles, so feel free. There was a man, and this is talking about Elkanah, this is um, Hannah's husband. He used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. They were priests, okay? And as priests, they were supposed to be the religious leaders of Israel. They were to serve as intermediaries. They were mediators between God and the people. That was their job. And they were supposed to be advisors to the nations, to the leaders. They were supposed to be advisors directing the nation where they should go. They were to maintain the purity of themselves and the nation. They were supposed to uphold God's law that was designed to protect them. You know what's funny? You'll see this later on. They were in possession of the ark that, hold, that held the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his finger. They had all this. They had a huge responsibility. And in this verse it says they did not know the Lord. They did not know the Lord. I have a quote here from Richard Phillips. I used him last week, and he has, he has some great phrases in this. And this is what he says. To then say that they did not know the Lord is to say that for all their access to divine religion and their knowledge of theology and the rituals of worship, these were unconverted men, spiritually ignorant of God's saving grace and caring for nothing for the demands of of his holiness. See, it didn't matter what they knew. It didn't matter how well they performed their rituals. These guys were spiritually dead. Dead. Which meant that their labor, everything they produced, had no value. Which then means, which then means they were worthless. They were absolutely worthless. They could produce nothing good. Now, what, what are the implications of this? What, what's the problem with having these guys in position? Well, as leaders, they were not only corrupt, as we can, we're going to find out in a minute, but they were corrupting the spiritual and moral, moral character of the nation. They were corrupt, and in turn, they were corrupting everything under them. And they were spiritually barren. Therefore, the nation was spiritually barren. You know what's ironic? If you've been following my series, the very first chapter of this book starts off with a story about a barren woman seeking the Lord to bring life, to have a child. 
And meanwhile, Israel is spiritually barren. And God's using Israel to make a statement. God's going to show Israel that he's the one that gives life to the dead world. Only he can do it. And this is the contrast of have. Now imagine the consequences of corrupting the spiritual and moral, moral character of a nation. Imagine the consequences of that. Then you have rampant theft, idolatry, you have adultery, you have murder, all the things that you can listen to the Ten Commandments. But just think about the results of having this bad leadership. And then I wonder, I look at today, what does it look like today? How would you recognize that today? Would you be able to see it today if you walked across the church, spiritual corruption? Well, pastors improperly using scripture for personal gain. And properly using scripture to, to manipulate and control people, misrepresenting the gospel. Teaching that God is a God who gives you the desires of your heart. And whatever the case is, it will lead people to perform, right? So if it starts off here on the pulpit and it goes down to you, it's going to lead you to perform your religious duties without ever knowing the entire meaning of why you're doing it. Just going through the motions. You can participate in communion. You can get baptized. You can give large offerings. You can repeat verses in the Bible. And never know the Lord. It's all possible. Because you would never fully understand the value of the cross. So, it's going to make more sense in about two seconds here. We're going to go to verse 13. And we're going to show you. I'm going to show you what was the problem. Why were they worthless and why did they, how, what, what, what the result was of not knowing the Lord. So here's what it was in verse 13. Here's what they did. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, if, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young man was very great in sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now, the first thing I want to say is, is it, this is accredited to the priest. When you hear the priest servants, this is what they were doing. This is a phrase of what they were doing. And I kind of want to give you a background. For you to understand how great this was, I have to give you from the book of Leviticus exactly what the procedure was. Now, this is what would happen. When someone would come, they would bring a peace offering. Okay, a peace offering to the temple. They would lay it in front, they would give it to the priest. The priest would then take it, and he was supposed to burn the fat. And the fat was strictly supposed to be given to the Lord. Okay? They would offer the sacrifice then the priest was only supposed to take the breast and the right thigh of the offering. And the remaining portion of the offering was supposed to go back to the people. Now, that was the process. So if you go back and you look, well, let me teach you one more thing. The peace offering, an actual reference, and you guys are going to be able to relate to this very quickly, was actually considered a communion offering. You said guys celebrate communion. What was communion used for? Was communion is for us to find a moment to worship and connect with God. It is a physical moment where I can take and concentrate and meditate on the Lord. It's worship. That is what communion is. Well, this peace offering was that. It was a place for people to come and worship and have a moment with God. Okay? Keep that in mind. Because if you remember, I read that verse earlier, 1 Samuel 1, 3. When it says this man, Elkanah, now it makes sense if you go back to chapter 1, used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. 
So these worshipers were coming to have communion with God. They wanted to have a connection with God. All right? And the priests were doing something else. They were destroying that personal connection with God and his people. I want to break down four things that they did wrong. They just in that passage alone. First of all, in verse 14, when they took the fort, and they took all that was for himself, they did whatever they wanted. They took whatever they wanted. They didn't take the law into account, the Leviticus law that they knew that they were supposed to do, and they chose the meat that they wanted for themselves. That's the first thing. They were only supposed to have the breast and the right thigh. They took the choice meat for themselves. That's number one. Number two, they were supposed to burn the fat. Okay? The fat, we know I just said, was supposed to be given to the Lord, and they kept it for themselves. Now, it's funny because when you read Leviticus, it makes you kind of hungry. Because when you read it, it says that the, the fat burning off is like a sweet aroma to the Lord. And I'm thinking like steak. Like, oh my goodness, that's so good. I was reading and studying this, and I'm like, I want a steak right now. Um, but this is what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to burn that off. And here's the thing. The worst part was the people knew what they said. Let me, let me boil the fat first, and then you can take what you want. So what were they doing? Not only were they breaking the law, they were actually causing the people to break the law. They were causing the people to do what they weren't supposed to do. And here's the third thing. They were oppressive. They were saying, verse 16, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. You know, Rob talked about oppressive leaders last week, and these guys were the perfect example of oppressive leadership. Now, and that's the idea. Someone suggested, hey, maybe I should bring the fat off. Maybe I should obey the law. The priest would take it by force. They would yank it and say, no, this is ours. You don't have a choice. They demanded, now here's the worst part. They demanded what was not theirs. It wasn't supposed to be for them, and they demanded it. That is awful. It's an awful place. Now, at this point, in this entire process, they're stealing the meat, and they think that they're just taking it from the people. What they're actually doing is stealing from God. They're actually stealing from God. Now, if that wasn't enough, this ends with outright disrespect. In verse 17, it says, For men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Contempt. What does that mean? It means that they treated the sacrifice and the offerings, this is very ironic, as worthless. They despised it. It had no personal connection for them. The sacrifices and offerings that the people brought were less important than their personal cravings. They just treated it as if it was nothing. So what does that mean? It means that they did not know the value of the sacrifice. They didn't know what it was standing for. They didn't appreciate it. Now, to magnify the problem, they were by despising the offerings and the sacrifices, that means that they were despising what? They were despising God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's salvation, God's grace, all in the same action. Because when you despise the sacrifice, you're despising everything that God has to offer. That is the ultimate result. And to make matters worse, look at verse 22 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. They used the temple as if it was a brothel. So it wasn't like as if they already did that with the sacrifices. They were literally committing sexual morality. Look at verse 23. And as he said to them, why do you do such things? This is Eli talking to his son, their, their son, their father here. For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. 
So the people are talking about it. The public is talking about what they're doing. They know what's right and what's wrong. He says, verse 24, No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord studying abroad. If someone sins against man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father. For it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now, we can say that Eli was old. He maybe have lo- he maybe lost some of his influence for toward his sons. Whatever he said fell on deaf ears. And Eli, as the father and the priest, had a couple options. What could he have done? You guys can probably think of this. He could have removed them, saying, "You guys are unworthy. You guys are disgracing the temple. Get out of there. You guys are fired." He didn't do that. He could have had them punished according to the law. The law was very strict. In fact, what they were doing was punishable by stoning, by death. They needed to be put to death. He could have done that if he was going to be honoring God. He even could have reminded them of their duties. Why are you here, sons? Why are you here? He could have reminded them going back. He could have sat there and reminded them of the scripture, telling them about God and his power and his might, the Holy One. The one that sat, the the I am on the mountain that thundered and everyone was scared. Guys, this is the God you serve. This is the God you're serving right now. Did you forget? Did you forget? And instead, his warning fell to the ground. And he passively let the behavior continue. Now, I want, to, I want to point out here, there wasn't anything that Eli could have said that would have changed their minds. Which also makes them guilty of another law. Here's another law. Are you ready for this? Young people, you, where are you? You're hiding up on top. They broke a direct commandment that God wrote, and that is honor your father and your mother. A priest disrespecting the wisdom of his parents. Disrespecting the, the, the warning of his fa- their fathers. They broke another law. And the sins just kept piling up and piling up. And God already had made up his mind. He really knew what he was going to do. You know, in the New Testament, it talks about storing up wrath. God stored up wrath. Well, he definitely stored up wrath for these guys. He's storing it up, and he's going he's gonna to make them pay with their lives. I want you to see this. You don't have to go there. Well, I think I have it up there. In chapter 2, verse 29, this is what God tells Eli he's going to do. He says, in verse 29, Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I command for my, commanded for my dwelling? And honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves with the choicest parts of every offering of my people. There it is. There's the problem. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. Okay, so this is what he's saying. The Lord is saying, this is what I said. The Levites should be, will be in my house forever, serving me in my temple. But he's talking to Eli now, and he says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, just like you did sacrifice, shall be lightly esteemed. Or shall be despised. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And then it goes on to verse 20, 34, and it says, And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be a sign to you, both of them shall die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build on him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. Now think about that. God's stripping up, stripping away Eli's family heritage. Eli, your family is going to be erased. Later on, there's another Levite family that will end up taking the lead, but Eli, you're done. You don't have anything left. And 
as he's vowing to uh, erase Eli's family, the Lord promises to raise up somebody for himself. I'm going to provide a priest. Kind of going back to the Lord, seeing a barren nation and showing them, I am the one who gives life. I am the one who raises up. God remained sovereign throughout all of Israel's failures. This is a great point to remember, that even when they were failing, even when there was barren leaders, God didn't just turn his back and say, I'm done. These guys are just never going to get it. No, he said, you know what? I'm moving you out of the way, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be in control. He doesn't give up on Israel. He doesn't give up. He's a merciful in providing his own solution. Now, meanwhile, I don't want to forget Samuel. Samuel was born by this time. And as he's there, he's a little boy. And I'm going to give you two verses because it's funny. You see, all, all this is happening with Eli's sons. And they only give us like two little areas when it talks about Samuel. And I put them both up there. Verse 18 says, Samuel was ministering before the Lord. The boy clothed in linen and ephod. Now, I could explain that a little bit more, but I don't have time. But that's, that's a very special thing. He was wearing the wardrobe he's supposed to wear. And he's doing the things he's supposed to do. And then in verse uh, 26, it says, now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and favor with the Lord and also with man. Samuel's going along, being obedient, working in the temple, doing his duties. He was performing all he was supposed to do, the complete opposite of what Eli's sons were doing, which they were supposed to do. He was just a boy. These guys are grown men. They were supposed to be busy doing God's work. And Eli was just had his head down and just kind of going along. Now what's profound about that verse, verse 26 that I just read, is that this verse, and I wish I had time to go into it, but it's no coincidence. In Luke chapter 252, it has the same language for Jesus as it did for Samuel. It says for Jesus, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It's almost identical to what they're speaking about Samuel. What is that saying? God is consistent. God is consistent. All of scripture, God is not just randomly doing things. When he's working in the heart of man, when he's working in the spirit, he, it follows the same thing. Favor with God. Favor with man. God is doing something. Remember that consistency when you're reading scripture. And I wish, like I said, I wish I had time. And, and it, I'm edging right now because I got, I got a limit here. And I wish I could get into that because it's so good. It's so good. Uh, but I have to shift your attention now. This is the message now. We kind of read through what was going on with Eli and his sons and the problem that they're wrestling with. And, and I want to switch to the gospel. I want to start connecting this to the gospel now. I will first note that uh, the, the issue was not the parenting of Eli. That was the case. We could easily blame Eli. Eli, you failed to do your job. You failed as a parent. You did not train your children the way you were supposed to. Uh, but that would be a false statement. You want to know why? Samuel, later on, when Samuel is old and he's, he's kind of getting tired, Samuel has sons and he gives his son to take charge to judge Israel. And you know what happened? They took that authority and started using it for personal gain. This is Samuel, the holy guy we're reading about now, the one that was ministering to the Lord and working hard. And what happened was that influence ended up leading them to demand a king. Well, we want a king. Your sons are awful. It's exactly the conversation they had with Samuel. You know, the point is, parenting has its strengths. I mentioned that earlier. Keep teaching your kids. But its weakness is that sinfulness always presents limits. It always presents limits. It truly requires God to move in your kids' hearts, in your own hearts. And, and it requires the gospel to impact them in such a way, through the Holy Spirit, to change the heart of the person. God gives life. We only produce death. That's sort of the, the main concept there. Now, we know, we've been teaching here for a long time, and if you've been coming to church for a while, you would know that all the sacrifices and offerings were a shadow. They were casting a shadow of the one who was to come, which was Jesus. The lamb without spot represents the lamb without spot. Jesus, right? They were, pre they, were, they were preparing us for a future atonement. So, if Eli and his sons truly understood their job, 
they would have been looking forward to the day when God would fulfill the salvation. The sacrifice meant more than just a ritual and just meat. It wasn't just meat for the soul or for the body. It was healing for the soul. And every sacrifice that would have come through their temple for them should have been a reminder of the communion that we're going to have with God. Here we're being in the presence of the Lord. The Lord's going to worship and be here. I mean, they, they were losing all of that. So the real question is, did they really understand what the sacrifice and offerings were pointing to? Did they really understand? And, and chances are they didn't. Because guess what? The only qualifications they had to be priests was that they were born into it. Eli was a priest and he was a father. That's the only qualification they had. They had no spiritual advantage. They were born into the Levites. And so the rituals became a routine and not an actual personal connection with God. And we could easily see their violations, as we just read right now, all their sins were exposed for us to see, um, but they never actually considered, it doesn't mention here, did they actually consider, I wonder, the consequences of those sins? Did they actually say, what's going to happen if I continue to blatantly sin against God? What is the cost? What is the cost? Every time they had an animal come to their door, it was killed. The animal lost its life. It was life for life, representing atonement, payment for your sin. And it was payment for all the wrong things that we have committed, and it was to make peace with God again. That's the cost. What about today? What about today? Do we take for granted the cross of Christ? I'm not going to talk about unbelieving people here because it's easy to pick on unbelieving people to take advantage of the cross. I'm talking about us as believers, us in this room. Do we fail to remind ourselves and our youth the value of the cross? You know, as I was preparing this message, I looked at myself, and as I preach right now, I have to ask myself a bunch of questions. So I ask myself, am I handling the word of God with respect and awe for who he is? Am I doing that? Do my actions glorify God? Is Jesus my real hope or am I just mouth? Are the words first my own? The things that I say to you, are they first my own before I bring them to you? They have to be mine first. They have to be personal. And I pray these things are always there. But what about you? What about you? What is the value of the cross to you? Do you really embrace the blood shed on your behalf? I want you to consider the cross. I'm going to take this as a, this is a heavy moment. Consider the cross. Before the crown of thorns was placed on his head, he was sweating blood in the garden. Sorry, hold on. Before the nails pierced his hands, he was beaten and slapped and spit on. Before he could say it is finished, he prayed in the garden, God, pass this cup from me if there's another way. But your will be done. Your will be done. And you know why he went through it? The cost was great, but the victory was great. He knew what he was going for. What is the value of the sacrifice for you? What, what is it for you today? Let's be honest and real with ourselves. What is it for you? What does it mean? I'm going to give you some biblical responses. I'm going to give you some, some other verses to show you. I have four sections I want to visit in Scripture. I'm just going to read through them. The first one is Colossians chapter 2. And you who are dead in your trespasses 
and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with you, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that, should, that stood against us with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, triumphing over them. So what's the first thing, the value of the sacrifice? Well, we were dead, destined for eternal death. The weight of sin was upon us continually. But now, but now we are alive because there is forgiveness. He disarmed all these, these you know, demonic creatures, haters of God, angelic beings who did not appreciate who God was. And he crippled them and he put them to shame and our re record was wiped clean. This is ultimately what this passage is teaching. Look at another one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting them to the Testing. Let's just go with it. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What is this? God is bringing us home to himself. That's reconciliation. He is restoring his relationship with his people. And he wants us to share this relationship. He wants us to express and teach people of the personal connection, the personal love that we have with him. Here. You know, I wonder, I wonder why is this happening now? Why is it happening now? I'm not concerned. The Lord's going to bring, he's going to, I'm, I'm not concerned at all. I feel like the Lord is really going to reach our hearts. You will receive the righteousness that you can't produce and the mercy that you do not deserve. That is a sacrifice. Here's Romans 5. Romans 5, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God. We were once enemies. You guys have seen the war. War is very ugly. We were enemies of God, and now we have peace with God through the cross. We have been declared justified. We're clean and free. What a kindness. Isn't that a kindness? God making peace between me and him so that I can have access to his heart. This is what he wants. How could I not rejoice? How could you not rejoice in seeing this when all I can see is failure and all he sees in me is his son? And he loves me. And he loves you if you are his child. We need to praise the Lord for the sacrifice. Every day, every moment, praise God for his love because in the sacrifice, his love was projected to the world. I love you and this is my evidence for it. Here's the last one, Galatians 4. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Because of this sacrifice, we have been adopted into the family. We are Jesus and God's children. I am now a son and an heir to a kingdom I don't even deserve. And in his kindness, he dressed me in his Holy Spirit. And in my struggles, I can call him Father. Father, I need you today. Oh, the value of the sacrifice is great. It is so great. Can you see the value of the sacrifice? Don't walk out of here today and miss the value of the sacrifice. Don't forget it. Cling on to it. Embrace it. Make it personal. Make it personal. Because here's the alternative. I'll give you the alternative. In Hebrews 10, for if we go on sinning, this is exactly what's happening with, with, the, with the priest. If we go on sinning, deliberately receiving, or deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But what? But a fearful and expectation of judgment and a fiery, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Now here's an example. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two witnesses. That was the punishment that those priests deserved. They deserved to die the punishment. Verse 29. How much worse a punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the, the Son of God? Who has profaned the blood of the covenant which, which he was sanctified, by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the spirit of grace. Verse 30. For we, knew, we know him he, who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. There's punishment. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I don't have to be afraid. This isn't a, a message to make you afraid. Oh, I didn't value the sacrifice. No, because of the sacrifice, you can be forgiven, and you can approach the throne, and you can have communion with God. You can have that right now. This is what remains for those who trample on their foot, who step on the cross, Rub it out and walk away. That's the abuse the priests were doing. They looked at the sacrifice. They didn't understand the value. They abused it and they satisfied their own stomachs. And they disregarded the value of what God was trying to do. He's trying to have communion with his people. And they were abusing it. And they were stealing it. And they were squandering it. Think about that. They missed the complete purpose of the sacrifice. The salvation offered to, through the sacrifice of Jesus is the most valuable thing we could ever have on this earth. I don't care how much retirement money you have. I don't care where you live. I don't care what you do for a living. You're nothing without the cross of Christ because I'm nothing without the cross of Christ. I'm nothing. I wouldn't be here today if it were not for the cross of Christ. Everything else is worthless. And this is the irony of it all. Everything else is worthless. It is the only hope to this dark world. Don't walk away without reflecting on that. Don't go through the religious motions. The next time you take communion, commune with God. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for letting me speak to you. Thank you for even listening to me when I whine and complain about useless things like my car not starting or, you know, just why would God even care about this thing? Because he cares about you. He cares about you. Here's a conclusion. As we follow the narrative, you're going to see, we follow the narrative, I want, to, I want to add this. Going back to the beginning of what I started, when scripture becomes personal, suddenly the sacrifice becomes a great possession. Because I get to see, wow, that's what you're doing? That's what you were trying to do? It isn't a part of life. It is what gives you life. And it isn't just information. I gave you a lot of information today. It isn't just information. There's an emotional connection. 
It is a love and affection between the worshiper and God. We need to make scripture personal. We need to share it with our children. The world needs to know this gospel. This is the real and only hope that they have and the only solution for the evil hearts of man. It's always been. God is the answer. Always. So I asked in the question in the beginning, worthless, and the flip slide, what is worthiness? Well, we need to praise him today. We need to praise him right now for not counting us worthless, but for making us worthy with his own blood. Let's pray. Father, in the midst of all the distractions that could have been this morning, I want to praise you. I want to praise you for your spirit. I want to praise you for your love. I want to praise you for your kindness, a kindness that we don't deserve. God, I wish everyone here would walk away just lit up in the spirit for you to be hungry and to want to embrace you and your word and what you've offered. Lord, the sacrifice is the greatest thing that we could ever have. And you did it out of love. May that rest true. And may it, may it resonate amongst everybody here. In Jesus' name, amen.